Hi, everybody. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm here today with Rick Carter, the two-time Oscar-winning production designer on The Fablemans, the uh, semi-autobiographical Steven Spielberg film. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Great to have you. And let's jump right in. Rick, uh, you've now worked on 11 of Steven Spielberg's films dating to Jurassic Park in 1993. Is it safe to say you're now officially part of the team when Steven mounts a film? You know, um, the answer is, of course, yes and no. Yes, in that I'm somebody who he, and I like to use the term Cass as a, a production designer over the years. So I'm not somebody that he's always turned to for every movie that he's uh, wanted to make. And while I've made a, a wide variety of movies with him, I I like the idea that that he has such a broad range. You know, he, he works with other designers and uh, most recently Adam Stockhausen is who's brilliant. And they they get along and do great work. I get along with Stephen. And I think there's just a at this point, there's a longevity to it. So there's certain types of dialogue that I think he likes to have with me and then see what comes out of it as a production designer. But it's not, it's not like being a member of a team. I was always a member of his team from the time I met him in the sense that he invited me in. But for a long time, for 20 years, it was Steven Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis. And I, I bounced back and forth between the two of them. It was only the two of them. But I found that that was very beneficial for me um, to have that broader context than than just be with one director. And I think he feels the same way about making his movies. Uh, yeah, I've seen that you've done a lot of Zemeckis films too. Um, uh, I've also seen it written, uh, Rick, that uh, you're not only Spielberg's production designer, but also his budget. <laughs> um, would, would that be true? I, I mean, and what did you do to save money on the fable? Uh, besides, I guess, bagging the storyboards for the most part, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, before I get this, this uh, the Fablemans, which I think I'm very helpful, uh, and and on that movie, I always try to be because I know Stephen likes to keep the movies as lean as he as he can, and he will he he is of the sensibility that you're seeing the little Sammy Fableman, in, the, in that he's got these two influences. His you know in that case it's Sammy with his mother Mitzi and his father. One's very artistic and one's very strategic. And Stephen is like both of those. So he will say often, uh, here are all these ideas I want to put in the movie, but I know, but we also have to cut the budget by 20%. And and many people will hear that sentence as one sentence and go, Well, doesn't he understand how movies made the ideas cost <laughs> money? But what he actually does is he knows that when he puts himself up against it that way, an idea doesn't actually have a price tag because a better idea about how to accomplish it, how you can minimal minimally do it or not show it might be better than the first idea. So it's part of what he uses to keep a rigorous part to his process that doesn't become gluttonous. So there's many, many times like from Jurassic Park, Amistad, Lincoln, those are the primary movies where I saved tens of millions of dollars by making suggestions. So it's not for me to say I saved it, but I came up with suggestions that then he could work with that would allow us to um, save the money by, by reconsidering what our assumptions were. You know, whether we're going to see these effect shots of the Raptors, whether we are, are just going to go to a place for Lincoln that doesn't have a tax rebate but fulfills all the requirements of the location if we shift things a bit in our minds as to what they are. Um, so in Jurassic Park, it was whole sequences that were in the book that were gonna be in the movie that we could do without. And they got put into later movies. But I think really for me on The Fablemans, it was about number one, and this wasn't uh, very difficult to come up with this because we were in a pandemic, that we're going to make everything in Los Angeles. So we're not going to have any, incur any travel costs that relate to what it is to go to another place. And we would try to do it the way little Sammy Fableman in his 20s might have been given the opportunity to make a movie for Universal 
back in the those days, and which uh -huh. is where Stephen and I both started, you know, with Universal TV shows. So we both knew that, and that was a good way to make it not a movie that's a that would go out of control in terms of its its appetite, um, and it could stay more intimate. And I think I think it makes it for a better movie ultimately. Absolutely. So your assignment, though, Rick, on the Fablemans was to recreate Stephen's homes in in the case of the film houses in uh, New Jersey, Phoenix, and Northern California. Was your task to literally reconstruct his homes from memory? Well, it's a combination um, in that <clears throat> some of them more than others, but there, there's sort of a three act structure with the the the, the houses and then the, the last epilogue, you know, the promised land of Hollywood. But the first one, we we knew what the a, a picture of the exterior looked like and then how to try to get close to that in Los Angeles. Uh, it, it's not that close, but it's somewhat. We knew from a floor plan that Stephen had drawn where the living room was and where the dining room was and the kitchen and the stairway in the, in the, uh, in the middle. So we wanted to make sure that those elements were accurate so that the staging as he was writing it would be reflected in the geography of the, of the rooms. So that you know, if somebody's in the living room and they're coming over, we'd know where it was, and there wasn't like, oh my God, that won't scene won't work now. So it was very basic because it's really just him doing a little simple drawing of of what his house looked like. Same thing for Phoenix, except that in that case we had a few more photos. We took a lot of liberties with it, but we did a little bit more work on the exterior. To make it look like the movie, the, the house that he had grown up in, and so in each state, and then the most uh, dramatic one was uh, in, in a sense of recreation, or not recreation, creating it was in Northern California because that house didn't exist; that it never was in that form where they all lived. So we made that one up as a craftsman house, as a set that would reflect what it would be like up there. And also the mood at that point in the movie, uh, which is more somber. And so that journey really forms a fable version. It's it's not just a recreation, although all the details, that's where it got uh, sort of deep was because it wanted to reflect, you know, the things that he remembered or his sisters remembered about growing up that would be trigger points for them, both the actors and for Stephen when he was constructing his scenes. So, um, and a lot of that also even related to the creation of movies within the movies, you know, like not, not only to create the world of on the exterior, but then the movies he was shooting. So the, the, the production design was not just a recreation, but it was a fabulization of his life. And then went into the, the subjective part of what not only is he filming, but what's his reaction as a young person to it that then becomes our, the audience's reaction. So the, the design had that, those multi dimensions is what I'm trying to get at. Even if yeah. lots of movies that are big, you know, expansive, spe spectacular movies, this was more uh, uh, about going as deep as we could on an intimate level. You mentioned um, Stephen's sisters. Did they give you a lot of points of reference for the homes they grew up in? And was it different from what their brother told you? Well, that, it was it was complimentary, fortunately, because <laughs> they had lots of ideas and they they remembered lots of things. And of course, you know, to, to them, there was Stevie, you know, who was just this precocious person running around filming everything. And um but they had their own lives. They were growing up, so they 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 gave lots of information and details to Karen O'Hara and Andy Siegel, the prop master, to to come up with the set decoration that would reflect what they remembered. Uh, and um, Stephen asked me to show the sets to them before he even saw them finished, so wow. so so that they would. And that was that was the only part in the whole movie where I went. Whoa, okay, because I, I know Stephen's consciousness and I knew what we had been developing and I had lots of dialogue with his sisters, but I didn't know for sure that they would go for this fabulized version, right? And but that they shows all, they all, real trust in you too. 
I, I think so. You know, it, yes, it does. And I take that as the compliment that it is. The other part is that you would do it too, if you could, which is put someone else out in front of you to hear, you want to hear the problem before it comes directly to you. That's you can really hear about it and you can kind of work yourself up into to like, what, what are you going to say? Exactly. Wait. At the same time, you must have developed a shorthand with Stephen at this point. Yeah. So you could even read his mind now to some degree. I, I actually, with him, we have quite a quite a mind melding uh, uh, ability. Um, I will say to him at times when we're get going on a conversation and you're getting into it, and you just sense that this is becoming bigger than the sum of the parts. We're starting to go somewhere. We, we don't really know what it is, but we know it's going to be something. And I'll sometimes just joke and say, you're about to have a great idea. And he'll say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I go, I can just tell that with the way we're talking about the subject, it's going to hit some place that's going to like, not only be what I say, and I often talk just so someone else will have, especially the director, a better idea. And then what will invariably happen with him in particular uh, is he'll come up with something and I'll go, see, there it is. And then, so it's that kind of over time where you have fun with the, the creative process. And it's not an approval process so much as exploring it. You both walk away going, oh, that, that, that's good. We could both now go in our directions and do our jobs. How closely did you work with um, with Karen O'Hara, the set decorator, and, and uh, Janusz Kaminski, the cinematographer who, who must be close friends, but at this point, you've worked together so often. Well, with Janusz, we've, we've, uh, we've done all these movies together. And I think there's a real trust and we like each other a lot. So that even if there's an issue, he's very clear about what that issue would be. He was, he's, he's so instrumental in making everything I've ever worked on look so much better than it would in any other context. And but in this particular case, he was he was saying, you know, he, he, the way he says, he, Ricky, Ricky, uh, make the rooms bigger than they would be. So I have room for the camera and I don't have to pull a wall all the time when I'm changing the, the angle. And so, you know, as a as a production designer, sometimes I'm wanting it to have an intimacy. But I also want the trust that he can get the camera angle where he wants it to be without doing a lot of work, you know, that's physical, like pulling walls and things. And so I, we just said, okay, fine. You know, we, and, and it was, it, it all worked out. This is this, just the specific on the Fablements, but he, I trust his, what he needs in any given moment for the lighting, the space, and just the collaborative nature of his work with Stephen. He is the reason Stephen makes the days that he makes and gets so much done. I don't know how he does it, but he's, he, he's not only able to have it all there and all the lighting, he's able to stay with Steven in this kind of dynamic of the shooting that really, really is magical to watch. I mean, the, the, the back and forth. So my trust in him is 100%. And, and, um, and then with Karen, I've worked with Karen before, and she's such a smart, intuitive, creative set decorator that it was great because I could bring her into the dialogue early on with Steven on these Zoom calls and then let her just go with it back and forth with Steven with what she was thinking or presenting. And I only had to be the sort of interpreter in the very beginning. And then they formed their own bond, which is, of course, makes it so much easier for me. And, and I'm always looking for it to be easier. <laughs> Easier is good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not young. Where like you know, I got to I got to do it all myself. I I learned on Forrest Gump that you know if you if something if someone else will do something and it's so and it works out well, you go well one less thing. You know, stupid is as stupid does. If you're just going to go in and knock yourself over and over against something that someone else could do, why are you doing that? What kind of a Hollywood professional <laughs> are you, Rick? Don't you know it's should, supposed to all be all about you and your ego? Well, but that's actually, you, you hit upon the real gist of it, which is I, I never got that memo because 
And look, my career, that's how I survived from the 90s into the 2000s was to start co-designing on some of these projects, Avatar, Polar Express, Star Wars. I've co-designed because I've needed to have the collaborators, collaboration of somebody who brings to the movie what I don't do so well and to give them the credit and the opportunity to have a career in that production design and to expand the notion of what production design is. So it's not considered just the person who does the physical sets, that it is about the full range of the visualization of the movie's worlds. So I, I, to me, the benefit of collaborating and not taking all the credit and has been immense and it's, it's led to the longevity. It's the only thing that's led to the longevity. Did Stephen react uh, emotionally to what you and Karen and your teams were able to create? And yes, well, we, we've heard how emotional he was in basically having his past recreated on the set right in front of him every day. Well, there was kind of a, an obvious goal that I was able to perceive from the very beginning. And that was that four months from when we started in January, sometime or whenever we got to literally showing Stephen the, the finished sets, uh, you know, I showed him the rough layout marked out on the floor. So he had an idea of what we we're going to do. But all three houses were on the same stage. So that was a way of, of the goal being have him walk on and go through his life from New Jersey to Phoenix to Los Gatos, in those houses, and feel each progressive step in one experience over the course of a few hours. And to see if that would, for him, give the baseline of an emotion that he could then go in and do all the specifics he had to do. So the answer is yes, it was it was very emotional. And I think he really enjoyed um, being presented with a kind of tour of the, the, you know, the it's the John Lennon in my life. You know, there are places I remember, you know, some are gone, some have changed, you know, you know, some forever, not for better, you know, but they remain as, as the things that, that you, that you knew you came from and, and to go back and revisit, you know, there's that adage that you can't go home again. And this is kind of a way that he was able to go back home and, you know, and not just recreate, but to re-examine what his early years have been about. And one of the reasons he hires you over and over, I'm sure, Rick, is your accurate recreation of Beatles lyrics, um, just, <laughs> like, just, just like that, in, in a beautiful way. Oh, I, hey, I J.J. Abrams sent me last night this TikTok of somebody, because he knows how much uh, we both like the Beatles, and I'm a nut, but, and it's, Somebody playing for this guy on camera. The camera's on him. And somebody's playing him just the first, like, second of a Beatles song. The first, like, nah, 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 nah. and there's, like, 30 of them. And he gets every one of them right. And wow. I could have gotten every one of them right. Almost, there's only one that I would have taken longer than than the guy took. Wow. And, and I, that very, was just, that was just very nice. impressive. Very it's impressive. It's impressive. It, it just... It, it shows you that the, some of the stuff that goes in, you know, you can have all this issue with memory in your life, but those, you don't have any problem with those memories because they, they are, they're stored in some other zone through a whole other thing and boom. So the answer is yes, I can, I can't, I can do a lot of that with lyrics and, so you know, true. I wrong, but I, it is my, it did. That's my formative years. Bef before we we wrap, uh, Rick, talk of thank you for, for letting it be so weird. It was a conversation, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Thank you for letting it be so expansive as a conversation, though. I, I love that. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, but anything you need, I'll I'll try to provide. Thank you. No, no, no. Well, just just to be specific for one more minute before we wrap, um, I wanted to talk for a moment about the scene at the end that you alluded to earlier, where Sammy Fableman is speaking with John Ford. You know, played by. David Lynch so memorably. Um, what were you going for in the way you staged and lit that interior? Well, the staging of that that I enjoy so much is the, that the, the, the set is the plot point. It, 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 there's comments, but really 
what happens is you go into a space in the outer office it's and it's not big and ostentatious because this is john ford at the latter part of his life but you see his body of work and you and you know some of that has rep has been influential a little bit to sammy maybe you don't know anything but but by looking at all of it and you see some of these maybe that you recognize maybe you don't if you're younger you probably don't but at least when it comes around to the man who shot liberty valance you you actually are looking at a movie that you know impacted his er, Sammy's early filmmaking, and it's it's literally the, the you know the scene that sets up the standing up to a bully because that's what Lee Marvin is doing in that scene as the robber. That's what the whole movie is about: is standing up to that guy and Liberty Valance. So now you're in the outer office, and those posters are telling you that and Steven's shot, which we didn't know it was going to be like that, but he came up with that simple just visual now you move to the inner sanctum there's the john ford you know david lynch is wonderfully chomping on his you know lighting his cigar forever right but the 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 funny thing about it is it seems like it's supposed to be technical and it is you have all these sort of western remington style paintings and they're all depicting a horizon that's either at the top or the bottom and you have all this emotion that's created all this confusion for little Sammy, you know, in his life. And now he walks into this great director and the director, instead of addressing his emotions, other than saying, you know, it, it's a tough business, it'll rip you apart. But he's basically saying, just tell me about this painting. What do you see? And what he's saying is that at the top, when the horizon's at the top or at the bottom, there's a drama to it. And that that's what the directing in the cinema is about is creating the drama in between is not really where you want it. So use that drama and feel that you're in a medium that can take that and do something with it. And, and, and it's totally it's a technical thing, you know, the top of the bottom, the top of the frame, good bottom of the frame, good middle, nothing, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> and it releases Sammy, because actually he has structure now for his emotions. And I think that's what Stephen felt was he had a medium that could bring all this emotional turmoil of real life and filter it through. And that becomes the message of the whole movie. Yes, it's his specific adolescence and growing up, but really it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great artist in cinema showing you who in the same medium, how they created their life in cinema by drawing upon real life and then that that's not easy and that there's a there's a tearing apart between uh real life and, and art and but you have to live with that and so i i'm actually quite hopeful that in the in the future way beyond this cycle of of the movie's life that younger artists can look at that and see the reference point for this art that he created which goes back to the the intimate personal experiences. Excellent point. And uh, that's all the time we have, Rick Carter. Thank <laughs> you for a fascinating conversation. Uh, here's hoping you land your fifth Oscar nomination when the Academy Awards nominations are announced on January 24th. And take care, sir. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> <laughs>